Hey everybody, it's Rajesh here. And Tane here. Welcome to our podcast, Baskets of Knowledge, Chess with a Difference. In our podcast, we invite guests from around the country and around the world to talk about how they got to where they are at the moment. It's about a journey, it's about an experience, it's about their life. Hello, to everybody. Welcome to um, another episode of Basket of Knowledge. Uh, as always, we hope you've spent the last week filling up your basket with some piece of knowledge. Because in case you didn't know, here in New Zealand it was Fijian Language Week. So, hola, benak, everybody. Tane, nice to see you after a few weeks of not being available, available to do a podcast with the guest. Yeah, yeah it's, good. It's, good. it's good to be back. I do miss being on the podcast when I have other commitments. But um, yeah, it's good to be on every opportunity I get. Fantastic. In, in these last few weeks that you've been away, what have you been able to learn or put into your basket of knowledge? I mean, the last week we spoke about reconnection, um, and I guess we've probably pulled from there, maybe. I think what I've probably reflected on the most is just, again, catching up with those people that I haven't connected with in a long time, um, but probably more from a personal perspective in terms of understanding that other people do see what you're achieving. Um, I think I've discussed this before, but, you know, sometimes when we're caught up in doing assignments or, you know, go, go, go. We don't actually see the inroads we're making in our journey. And so it's good to be able to hear certain people say, you know, it's cool to see what you've been doing or what you've been achieving because sometimes you don't actually see that for yourself. So it's been real encouraging, especially as we come into exams and, you know, a stressful situation, it's good to have that reassurance that, hey, you actually are doing, you know, something and that's better than nothing. Yeah, it's so crazy. And that's going to dovetail to what I what I have learned as well. You know, um, you don't know what you, this is going to sound terrible, you don't know what you're good at because when you're writing a CV, for example, it's so hard to write a CV. I find it the hardest thing to do. And, you know, you you write all these things here and then you give it to somebody who is maybe your manager or someone that's senior and he goes, you forgot about this, you forgot about this. You're like, yeah, but that's just that's just normal. You know, that's just what I think is normal. So, um, you know, it's I think it's it's a quite a good um, reflection that you are doing some good things and people out there will recognize that even though you don't think it is a thing. The other big learning I had this week, or big um, relearning, I guess, was um, I don't know if you've heard of the three circles of control. So I had a, an amazing uh, workshop this week with one of the with an amazing staff member, and they spoke about the three circles of control, where you have the outer circle, the inner circle, and the inner circle. In the outer circle, there's things out of your control, and no, no control, no influence. Inner circle is no control, some influence, and the closer circle is full control, full influence. And a lot of us live in the world where we are in the outer circle where we have, we try and control, we can't control, we forget about the inner control. And it's so crazy. Um, we all, we all guilty of this. I think that we try and focus on things that, hey, the, this stuff here, which is zero control, and instead of focusing on the stuff that we can control. And um, yeah, that was just an awareness that I'm probably going to think about more and write about more in my, <laughs> wherever I write stuff. Awesome. Um, that's that's enough, I guess, from the two of us because you know we keep talking on forever and ever. But it's not about us, as always. Um, our listeners out there are here because they want to hear from some of the guests that we bring on. And as always, we try and scour the country and the world to bring on some amazing people. And today, I am really, really honored and privileged to invite and welcome on our guest, Lucy Hughes. Welcome to our podcast, Lucy. Kia ora, guys. It's it's lovely to be here. Lovely to talk to you both. Brilliant. Lucy, before we start, can you just tell our listeners a bit about who you are at the moment and where you are at the stage in your in your journey? Yeah, so I'm um, in the second year of my PhD. And so I am studying, well, I'm at Victoria University of Wellington. Um, I did my Bachelor of Science um, and Honours at the University of Otago. And so I studied chemistry. <clears throat> and that's now continued into my PhD where I do drug development and drug design um and so yeah I'm really lucky to do what I do it's um it's pretty special to you know be the person that um gets to do all this medical research I think like right at the bottom you know I feel like not many people see that so um yeah that's what I do oh, very cool that, that's a very um very understated a welcome but that's awesome we're going to get into the real Lucy while we get into this here Lucy so let's start right the journey um, let's reflect back to you as a year 13. If I said to you, hey, Lucy, year 13, you're going to be doing a PhD in a few years' time, what would you have said to, to me when we met all those years ago? I don't know. I don't think I ever really had much kind of foresight. You know, I was sort of just looking at, oh, this big move down to Dunedin from Taranaki. You know, I was, I was like, oh, I've just got to do this thing. That's what I'm focusing on. I think I would have 
not potentially said you're crazy, but just been like, oh, slow down. You know, like I've I've just got to do this thing first that's in front of me. Um, yeah. And it's, it's pretty crazy because you know when you when you're in year thirteen, there's you have the the the, the spectrum of those that go cool just one step at a time, and those that have planned their whole life because they have a job title ahead of them and it's, it's different depending on which um cultural construct you come from as well but let's go back to living in taranaki growing up in taranaki what is that like for you as a young person um we've had lots of people from taranaki on this podcast and they all speak highly of taranaki and tane is from taranaki as well yeah what's that like for you as a young person because you had to leave to go to any tertiary yeah i think just like anyone else um you know that leaves to go to university you you don't realize what you have when you're there like Taranaki is just an awesome place it was a really great place to grow up um you know it's just like I I think it is kind of lacking things for young people um like people my age but like to actually be a young person the schools are really good it's so nice being outdoors and I think one of the crazy things that I always forget or that I used to always forget about and now I see it every time is the beautiful mountain that's just always there you know I it was in my backyard for so long and I I just took it for granted and so it's it's really nice to go back there now and I feel like I have this new appreciation for this place that I spent 17 years in you know um and it, it's I think it's about having that distance um and so yeah it's it's I I, I really enjoyed growing up there it was it was lovely fantastic and i mean it's a pretty pretty special place i have a joke about taranaki well i'm a joke a story when i was given taranaki as a region all those years ago my colleague said to me hey when you go to taranaki you will see this amazing mountain it'll be so beautiful blah blah so i arrive in taranaki and i'm driving and i'm driving all around the region so how about uh, taranaki and i don't see this mountain i'm like what mountain are you talking about there's no mountain here so i was there for a week went back to wellington i said hey Cheryl, what mountain there's no mountain she's like what are you talking about you lying to me there's no mountain and then I went back maybe three weeks later and I was like, how on earth did I miss this mountain here? It's right in front of me. It's just so, so it hides, right? It hides from you, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. It can hide behind some clubs sometimes. Oh, that's funny. That's, that's so funny. crazy. Um, so you had this, you had the choice now of leaving. Um, yeah, well, you had to leave, you had to leave to go and study. What is your family and your whanau like when you had said, hey, per, hey, Peter, and say, whanau, I'm, I'm leaving now. Were they supportive or is it, um, so hey, I was, Sorry. I was the sorry. Um, I was the <clears throat> I was the first in my family to go to university. Um, I'm the I'm the youngest of of four, um, by a really wide margin. Um, so I'm 23, and the next youngest sibling is is 31. Okay. So um, they're all much more grown up than I am, and none of them went to university. They all did trades, or became um like worked at the supermarket or something like that, and so. When I told my parents that I was going to university, they weren't very supportive um, at the beginning. They were sort of like, um, you know, you're not going to get a job or what a waste of money kind of thing. You know, they they really wanted me to do a trade. Um, and so I think in, in that sense, it was it was quite difficult to like, I didn't really have anyone in my family to talk about the process, to yeah. help me through it. Um, and because my parents are immigrants, we didn't have any extended family that really did anything like that. So I think um, I think when I left, it was I think it was quite isolating. Really, they were kind of just like bye, um, yeah. but um, they're they're of course incredibly supportive now. They're um, yeah. really supportive now. And it's really it's really hard, you know, because like you said, first in family, they have you have no idea, you know. Um, I meet lots of lots of families and young people who see their siblings um, working in a trade or in a supermarket and doing extremely well, extremely well. They're going, hey. Why would I send my young person over to university when their siblings are smashing it? You know, they didn't go there. And as an immigrant, as an immigrant, those are high risks. It's a it's a high risk model to send a young person over and a very financially expensive risk. So, you know, you can understand the issues and but hey, um, it's awesome you don't let that stop you because it's so easy. I see lots of young people in the same situation. Actually, hey, maybe I'm just gonna be constrained and not go because mom and dad are correct and I should probably just stay at home. So I have to acknowledge you for, for taking that step there because it is a, it is a bold step to go against what your family is saying. And then you you, you come to university. What is that like for you? You come here and um, hold the yeah. world, I guess. Yeah. Well, so I I didn't actually do year thirteen. I um I I skipped a year of school. Yeah. Um, and I got level three in year twelve. Um, my school. Um, I went to New Plymouth Girls High, and they had this cool program where they put forward a class uh you know 30 girls to 
kind of go ahead and most people stay and just do extra classes but school really did not agree with me I hated being there from 9 a.m till 3 p.m it was it was just not my thing I was always bunking I was always doing stuff like that so um, I was like why not go to university so I went off to university and to be honest I actually found the first year quite hard um I you know living in a small place like New Plymouth um I kind of knew everyone around me I grew up with these people um these people like really knew me and you know how some people go to university and it's like a kind of a chance to reinvent themselves I kind of went to university and I was like oh I kind of have this opportunity to reinvent myself but I don't really know who I want to be I I I kind of struggled to make friends I think um at the beginning which is kind of funny in hindsight because I made like so many unreal friends and like I wish I could just tell first year Lucy to just relax take it yeah. easy be yourself yeah and that's, that's the hard thing and that's the message we've had come across quite a bit um about how do you find your authentic self you know when you when you go into any environment university is probably the biggest environment where you have this massive change and everyone is doing what they culture think is the right thing to do I use the word culture in the university culture and you actually lose yourself and you don't have time to think about yourself and it's really hard you know there's no there's no manual there's no guide there no. is no there is no way <laughs> there's no suggestions but it's your yeah. own journey um and like you said you know at that point you were like what is going on here and it's pretty scary yeah. Tana, did you feel the same thing when you came along yeah definitely I think especially in those first probably couple of months because as you say you know you don't know many people down here um and he had one of them come from my school and he went to a different hall um and then I had a couple of friends and obviously met people through hands-on that I knew were coming down but even still, you know, even if you've only met them for a week, you don't know who you're trying to be within those um, social environments. And so, especially in that first probably week, two weeks, it was about who do I want to be in regards to the whole, you know, and what message do I want to portray about myself, which is hard to do when you're at that young age, you know, you've just made this massive step of going away from home and, you know, you're trying to rediscover yourself, let alone try and figure out what message you want to send across to everyone else. So it is definitely a couple of challenging weeks. Yeah, and then, um, and can you remember, Lucy, the time when you just started to feel feeling comfortable? Is there a time or a moment that goes, actually, hey, this is, this is okay? I remember, um, I remember kind of moving to uni, and I was all, I was kind of hyper aware of the fact that I needed someone to flat with in second year, um, because people talk about it instantly. Like people talk, kids talk about it far too early. Um, and so I was like, oh my God, I need to make friends. And um, I I remember kind of the moment where I made, or like I met these girls. Um, it's funny, um, they were like some of the only like Māori and Pacific Islander girls in my hall. And we just all kind of like agglomerated. And um, I just remember meeting them and hanging out with them and just thinking, oh, I am I feel relaxed. And this so this probably would have been like in, maybe April so it was a few months and and I just remember feeling really relaxed around them and and that was really nice but I think I honestly don't think I felt like my true authentic self that I am now really until my second year um yeah, yeah. and um I'm going to turn back to your your cultural identity so um you said you felt relaxed when you found um, other Maori Pacific uh, young people has that been a big part of your life your cultural identity or how does that fit into your, or how does that fit into your, being an immigrant parent, immigrant family as well, how does that all fit in this crazy diverse world we live in? Yeah, so um, my mum is Filipino, so um, that's kind of the culture that I have, and so I think it's more just, you know, coming from somewhere like Taranaki, where you're always, like, you're always surrounded by people that are Māori and Pacifica, or um, I guess, like lots uh, like I was always surrounded by lots of other Filipino um, people as well and it's kind of just you know that shared I guess you know kind of understanding of culture and respect of culture and I don't I don't even know if it's anything potentially specific to Māori and Pacific Islander people but um, there's just something about like you know that shared understanding of culture and what you go through um, just like actually not being white in society and especially in New Zealand and I think um it was it was definitely a big shock moving from New Plymouth which I feel it like is there's a lot of cultures there it's it's a very cultural place and then moving down to Dunedin where 
the most cultural thing there is the university um whereas like the rest of Dunedin is um is very wide um and so kind of I think getting used to that and then finding my space there was I wouldn't say it was difficult but it was um just something I wasn't expecting to reckon with I wasn't expecting to kind of come face to face with my cultural identity in that sense yeah and, and it's, it's pretty it's pretty challenging you know when I moved here from from Africa I still remember I come from Africa and um I was like, whoa, this is a very, I went to university in South Africa and in South Africa, um, this was post-apartheid, so it was pretty crazy and really, really just a whole mixture of black, white, Indian, Asian, the whole, the whole lot. And I came to Dunedin and I was like, oh, it's a little bit different and it's so yeah. hard to find, find your identity. Um, and, it, and I'm going to say it leaves a bit difficult because, um, like you say, you don't know where you fit in. As an immigrant, you're like, I don't know actually, what do I fit in? And, you know, when I first came in, because growing up in South, growing up in Southern Africa, we have a there's a race called colored because they're a mixture of black and white. So there's an actual race called colors, you know, kept colors. I still remember meeting my first uh, Maori person and I was like, hey, you're in my world. I thought I was just in common terminology. I was like, hey, you look like a colored person. And that almost got me destroyed because that is a racist term for yeah. in, in, in New Zealand. And I was like, wow, I've got to really, really think myself because in 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 Africa growing up if you were Indian or if you're Indian you were classified to be a colored you were you, you were you were like colored so I was like oh, I found my people and I almost got destroyed I was like oh maybe I haven't found my people where do I, where do I sit this is it was such a crazy yeah. crazy world so it is a it is a difficult transition um but I think things have hopefully changed but I like how you say the universe is the most culturally diverse place in that five can radius and then it just changes as you go further away from there. Yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. So and then, so was chemistry always your jam, or was chemistry something you picked up along the way when you came to university? I'm. I think I'm one of the very rare people that came to university to do something and stayed with it and continued doing it. You know, into post grad and stuff. I'm probably one of the very rare people who didn't switch degrees. Um, in year twelve, when I decided to go to uni, I was like, I I, I just need to choose something, um, and I didn't want to do first year health science I didn't think I was academic enough for it um for you know the kind of um what's the word the like everyone says first year health science is incredibly hard so I was like oh that's not for me you know I'm not the most academic person in the room and then I was like well what else do I like and at the time I was taking history and English and I really liked all those things and I was really I did lots of arts and all I could hear in the back of my head was my parents telling me I've got a useless degree um so and and as a result of that I I chose chemistry because it was my it was my favorite science um and then I and then I went to university and I I hated my first chemistry paper absolutely hated it um I it was I think it was my worst paper that semester as well um and so that was sort of I I, I did a really big mix of things in first year um like you're told to you know kind of put your fingers in all these different yeah. parts and figure out what you want to do um and then and I was like to myself, if I don't like chemistry in second semester, I don't have to stick with it. I can do something else. Um, and then I did the second semester chemistry paper, which is the one that's not um, required for first year health sciences. And um, I, I just loved it. The It was taught really well, um, much smaller class sizes. And, it, and I really got along with the lecturers. Um, I specifically remember having a a female lecturer um in a garden she's she's just awesome and she just like kind of opened my world to um this this whole new world of chemistry that you never touch on at school um and it, it was pretty wild yeah it was good and it's, it's so crazy how a, a lecturer or a teacher has such a huge impact you know we only reflect about that as you as you go you know when you leave university you think about the teacher that was profound at school when you're in postgrad you think about the lecturers that were Pretty profound in your undergrad program and then as you become a, a lick as you become a phd student you know people are going to be looking up to you even though you don't realize that you know you start being a teaching fellow you become that person um and it's pretty pretty crazy how that just evolves that evolution um yeah i i because so i um tutored for a couple of years in halls i tutored at studham and and hayward and i i actually tutored psychology because psychology was my minor but I, yeah. on the way, convinced a couple of people to take up chemistry as a major. And um, I, you know, have, have bumped into them as they finished. And I've just been like, oh, like, you know, thank you so much for 
getting like you know actually just pushing me to do this other chemistry paper I really loved it like the same one that I loved um yeah. and so that's that's always really nice it's, uh, but you know it's, it's a lived experience right it's not a it's not a hey maybe you like this I've actually I've done this I really enjoyed it you know and I'm sure Tana you've got the same same story there with your with your crazy journey of study yeah yeah, for sure. There's definitely been lecturers that um, stand out for me, you know, just to, <clears throat> I think the biggest thing is their passion towards the paper. Like I can definitely see those lecturers, especially in first year, who are like, oh, this is so basic or generic and I don't want to be here. I don't want to be teaching it. Whereas other lecturers really had a passion for, you know, including first years and getting them involved because they knew how much that would mean, not only in that paper, but probably across their whole university journey. And so it's awesome to see that some lecturers, you know, actually want to put in that little extra bit of effort just to ensure that you have a good journey. Um, you know, there definitely has been lecturers that I haven't enjoyed and that's just a part of it, but I guess it's, you know, similar to the high school journey as well. It's part of life, right? You're not going to like everything. You're going to like some things, you're not going to like other things, but it's the perseverance to that. Lucy, so we focus on the academic side. Let's talk about Lucy as a person, as, you, as Lucy was evolving and changing. Um, what are some of the biggest the biggest things that came to you in your life as, as a person as you started the, as you started to identify and find your thing yourself, I guess? Yeah, so I think kind of some of my biggest identifiers is that I like um I'm a part of the LGBT community. Um I came to university out. So um I, I came out to my parents um it, when I was in my final year of school. And they were incredibly supportive. And I think, you know, I kind of got the, oh, we knew, you know, kind of thing. And so it, it was it was really nice being able to go to university as, you know, like Lucy, the gay person, and not have to rebrand myself in that way, like I felt like I did at yeah. school and, and not have to come out. And, and a lot of people say that. I know a lot of people that loved the fact that they can just go to university and be their authentic self. Yeah. And whether that's gender or you know, kind of um, whether it's gender or sexuality. Um, and I think that's that, that was really special for me to just kind of show up and and just be me and people accepted me for that and, and I just loved it. It was awesome. Which is pretty, I mean, that's, that's pretty pretty um, awesome that you've been able to do that there. We know a lot of young people where they come to university and like you said, they have got to re-identify themselves. Um, they're not fault of their own. You know, sometimes they come from um, families or cultures where, you know, um, if they if they if they were if they came out there would be a whole lot of um you know negative negative stereotyping around that there it's pretty awesome you had you had that supportive family to say right cool hey if you knew you were you knew you were gay that's cool don't worry about it and you just carry your life um and Tana you would have seen this I guess I guess both of you would have seen this in your in your time as working in the different university spaces with young people yeah, definitely. I see it probably not so much within the subwarden space, and it can be difficult at times to, you know, support those in different, you know, in different stages of, you know, whether they're coming out, whether they have come out to their friends but not their parents and stuff like that. Um, even just, you know, a lot of their values may be different here compared to back home, and that's absolutely fine. But I guess it's trying to find a way in which you can encourage it without feeling like you're poking and prodding and saying that they should do certain things, you know, because you just want to guide them on their journey more than give them advice because although we might think we're helping, it might actually, you know, see the opposite effect of what we wanted. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so what are, what are the other cool things you've, you've, you've learned about yourself as you've been, oh, actually, no, let me rephrase, not, not cool, things that you've learned about yourself as you go to the university, because university is, um, is just, boom, Three years of just boom all the time. Yeah, I think I think one thing that um, I learned from university was that I could work incredibly hard. Um, I had never worked so hard in my life, and I, I just wanted to, you know. Um, I I I loved studying, and I, I really I found that about myself. It sounds so silly, right? Like I I reckon I could keep going back to university. I I always joke to to my partner. Once I finish my PhD, I might go back into a law degree. And she's just like, don't, like, stop. It's, um, yeah, I, I just love studying. And so, you know, I kind of, I never really considered myself as a, as a hugely academic person. You know, despite being excelled at school, I was always the one cracking jokes. I was always the one kind of not paying attention. And so kind of going to university and finding this passion for education and, and finding this passion for just learning was 
was something I think unexpected um but but really nice and yeah and I also found this huge passion for for chemistry which is great of course Okay, and I think the other passion that I'm going to also talk about is you're, you're giving back. You're doing a lot of giving back to the community. And I have been lucky to have seen you operate in the hands-on space where your passion is just amazing. <laughs> you know, um, amazing. doesn't really even talk about how awesome it is. And is that part of your your giving back? Is that just something you're like, hey, this is, this is a, you know, you speak about the passion for education. Is that part of your, your passion for giving back as well? Yeah, absolutely. I think when I think about what I want my career to have in the future, I, I just know I, I want it to, to give back to young people and to give back to the system that has given so much to me. You know, I got so much out of my university experience and I, I want to kind of help young people, yeah, young people through that. And so that was how I ended up at Hands On. I didn't actually go to Hands On myself, um, but I had friends who did. And they just said it was, they came back and they were just buzzing. They said it was the best. They were telling me all about it. And I remember going to university and being like, I want to be a redshirt. Like, that's what I want to do. Um, which is funny because I never went. But um, it, it is just so nice kind of just being able to be a friendly face in the university system that they can relate to um, yeah. for whatever reason, whether it's they look like me or they're queer or they want to do chemistry or something like that you know um it's really important to just be there and like be like have conversations have these chats with young people I mean it's your whole job right have chats with young people and yeah. get them into the um to the university system and and help them out yeah I mean it's 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 really quite interesting how you put that because not everyone sees that as a as something they want to do they come into university they do their thing and off they go and that's fine isn't there's nothing wrong with that there everyone's got their own space and and you you see when young people come to hands on for our listeners out there who don't know hands on is it's a week down in, at the University of Otago where young people between the ages of I guess fifteen sixteen or seventeen come and have an experience for some of them it's their first time away from home, um which is where as Lucy and Tane have previously mentioned and Andrew and Bo have mentioned their red shirts and they're basically the first or the people that these young people get to get to interact with as as old sibling or I don't know how to even how to even put that because it's a pretty it's a pretty unique um, role to have and you know just giving back in that way it's not just academic it's actually academic is very slight timing that it's the actual growth of that young person over that week there which is pretty um pretty great and you know watching watching you in that space is pretty pretty awesome yeah and, I, as, and also your, your colleagues as well in that space pardon me and also your interaction with the colleagues as well is, is pretty important because you know um there's lots of academics or people that love education that are not that and, and it's, i love the way you put it before i you love joking you love being distracted and a lot of people go oh if that's the case you can't be an academic and yeah. you, you 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 carry that line so well i mean how has, has that been part of your persona as well yeah absolutely i think i think there's uh, there's something to be said about academics right and, and they can be quite intimidating they can be you know um, people who are not necessarily approachable um, and so I think it's just always been in my nature to kind of joke around and laugh but I think it's so important to carry that into academics and carry that into a professional atmosphere because I think at the end of the day university is so much fun and at the end of the day the way that you're going to get people through degrees and people through postgraduate study is it's just by making it fun and just being friendly and being approachable and I I don't love the seriousness of academia sometimes. I, I definitely understand, you know, there's lots of money flying around. It's really important to be serious. But I think um, it's it's so important to build that rapport um, and to actually be able to build that with students. You know, I was really lucky and am still really lucky to have really excellent supervisors who take time to build rapport with me. And I, I think it's just a lot easier to do that with young people when you when you joke around you know and you you laugh with them and you make jokes so and, and the thing is your authentic self is not you know you're trying you're not trying to be funny it's just who you are as a person i think and i think that's the big difference you know when someone's pretending this is someone's actually this is who i am take it or leave it i'm a serious person i'm a funny person this is who i am and uh, i i just don't even think i could i, I don't even think i could be serious you know like i think yeah. if, if i was expected to be serious perhaps it's not um perhaps it's not the place for me to be yeah, exactly, totally, and it's awesome that you that you can identify that and realize that there. And um, so now you you are doing your academic journey. You you get into your honors program. When did the 
I guess the um the idea of a PhD step into your mind because you know most people go undergrad honors master's PhD you do your honors project what is the um the driver there what do you want to tell listeners about how awesome you are with how you got to that PhD stage yeah yeah I guess kind of I realized in my third year so in at Otago in the third year of your chemistry degree you get the opportunity to do a research project and it's it's so awesome to get into the lab, you know, have your own projects that you're looking after, do your own science. And I remember doing that and just being like, wow, I, I really love this. Um, I, I don't know what I was expecting to get out of my chemistry degree. Um, I didn't know that being a researcher was a thing when I started my chemistry degree. Um, and then, yeah, I did that research paper and I was like, this is, this is just awesome. Um, and I got, I got really excellent grades. Um, and I kind of also found a, a passion for public speaking in that space as well, um, because you obviously have to you have to be able to present your science in a palatable way to people. Um, but so yeah, did did that paper, really loved it, um, and then went back with the same supervisor to do my honors. And honestly, honors was so hard; it was so much work. The the chemistry honors, I think they've actually potentially made it easier now, but. Um, it, they you know they they purposefully put you through the ringer they they want you to be this very specific type of hard-working otago graduate and um that's that's the exact type of person that, that that they're churning out and so so yeah did my fourth year um tied top of class with one of my best friends which was just a, so we actually went to halls together and so kind of being able to finish um together with him and um kind of tie top in class with him was was really lovely because I was also kind of always kind of chasing his coattails because he's he's incredibly intelligent um and so yeah and then I was like one of one of my favorite things that I actually heard recently was um I asked one of the researchers at work kind of we were doing an outreach um thing with um some students from one of the local high schools and I go to him I was like how, how did you get here and he goes, honestly, I just kept doing what I liked doing. And I ended up here. You know, I never thought too much in the future. I just kept doing what I liked doing. And so I always told myself after honours, if I didn't want to do it, I, I didn't have to do a PhD, of course. But I, I just really liked it. And I I knew that I would be happy continuing. And um, I think it had also become a bit of my identity, you know, Lucy, the 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 chemistry major, a wee bit. But um, yeah. It was, it was always kind of a natural progression. It was always like, you know, kind of at the end of third year, you go, what am I going to do next? It was always like, well, of course I'm going to do honours. And at the end yeah. of honours, it was like, well, of course I'm going to do my PhD, you know? So yeah. that's kind of been the natural progression of it, I think. Oh, really awesome. And um, I, had this really, I, love, I love how you have that advice you got was just do what you enjoy doing. And it's really hard, you know, um, if I skate right back to where I am in, in the space that I work in, I really try and emphasize the fact that, hey, let's not forget about the career path. You eat, it's there. But if you don't enjoy what you're doing on day one, then you're not going to get to where you want to go. And it's but it's a hard message in, as, as adults as well. If someone says to you, just do what you enjoy doing, they go, I've got to pay the bills, I've got to do that. And you're like, actually, yeah, but if, you, if you're struggling, it's never going to be enjoy, enjoying right enjoyment. And um, it's a really awesome piece of advice that you got from your, your colleague, I guess, at the time. Yeah, and I think something like research, it, it requires so much passion and it requires so much hard work. And you know, extra hours that um, may not necessarily be seen by your colleagues or that you're even paid for, you know. Yeah. Um, and so to, I, I guess just like with any profession, you're, you're not going to do well unless you love it. And so yeah. um, it's really key, especially in research, to to only do it if you love it. I love what you said because research is a, um, it's, it's, it's a thankless task, right? You know, and we'll talk about it in a second. It's a thankless task. You, you're doing what you do and people look at you that are not in the research world going, hey, Hey Lucy, why are you doing that? Why are you spending hours trying to write this mm -hmm. article? Who cares about it? Who's going to read it? But actually, you know, people out there will read it, and the world will change, or maybe, maybe not. But at least it's your passion that's out there. Um, and I still remember when I when I was doing my masters and my PhD, and my supervisor was like, "You have to do research articles." Like, why? Why do I do research articles at that point in time? And then you spend so many hours doing research article, and everyone around is going. Is that going into a magazine? And they're like, no, it's not a magazine. It's going to a journal. Like, what is what is a journal? <laughs> like, people that are not in academia, and it's so so crazy. But it's um, it's quite the journey. So you 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 um, you find this passion, you find this love, and now you have an option of doing a PhD. And again, you could go anywhere with your PhD. 
how did you um, end up where you are at the moment? And I guess the, the topic that you're doing at the moment. Yeah, so kind of um, pre, so I did my honours in 2020. Yeah. And so 2020 um, was a, a very eventful year, obviously. Um, and so kind of at the beginning of 2020, I was looking at um, PhD programs overseas. I was looking at going to the UK. It was kind of always my plan, four years in Dunedin, hit the world, you know. Yeah. Um, but then kind of obvious, obviously COVID happened. And so I very quickly, you know, I had my net cast all over the world and then I brought it right back into New Zealand. Um, and, and, and I'm actually really thankful that I, I did because um, I'm really loving being in Wellington. And so that leads me to where I'm doing my PhD. So um, I kind of looked at Christchurch, Wellington and Auckland because I think one of the reasons that I wanted to leave Dunedin was because I absolutely loved my time there. You know, I, I really loved it. It was, you know, um, it, I just had so much fun and made so many awesome friends. But, you know, I think one of the very special parts about Dunedin is that it's always changing. Um, the the cohorts always moving on and um it really moves with the university and i i think i didn't want to kind of um stay in dunedin and leave it disliking it i i know Sorry. a few people that left it disliking it and I, I think that's such a sad way to end such an awesome time so i was like at the very least i've got, I, i'm going to move to a different place um and so i um, my old supervisor had some colleagues where I am now. So I'm doing my PhD at the Ferrier Research Institute. And so the Ferrier Research Institute is an arm of Victoria University of Wellington. So I'm not actually up at the Vic Uni. Um, I'm out at this external research institute. And I remember um, one of the researchers came and gave a talk um, at Otago. And I just remember thinking That's, that science is just so cool. That's just so interesting. Um, and just the way he held himself as well, he really like kind of got up there and just delivered the science and there was just clearly a lot of output there and um, it, it, it was just, um, I think it was kind of one of the, the first talks I heard that I was like, wow, that, that's really cool stuff. Um, and so I, I guess I just reached out to all of them. Um, I, or I reached out to the researchers at the Feria and and had a chat to some people and and that's how I ended up on my project now is um I I talked to my current supervisor and she um she she had this project going yeah awesome and oh, it's crazy how, how that works and I, I like how you say I think this is applicable to any industry that it's awesome to leave on a high you know otherwise you end up you end up Dunedin for example is very transitional you know and if you your cohort leaves you end up going wait a minute and you keep living in the past uh when i was yeah. here this is this is what it was like and it's awesome to leave but it's it's a brave decision as well to do that you know to go actually i need to go and chase the world this has always be here your peers will always be around the world but that's pretty cool um do you want to tell us a bit about your project yes yeah. it's it's, it's yes. everyone's it's every, it's every phd's love question yeah 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 so um I um so I do synthetic organic chemistry so I'm you can essentially think of me as the person who is mixing chemicals together and you know heating them up and seeing what they make I'm like you know the classic image of a scientist that you probably have in your head um and so that means that I get to design and make drugs which is really cool and so the disease that I'm focusing on is a disease called crab eye disease and so Crab eye disease is a very, very rare um, disease that is inherited. And unfortunately, there's no treatment for it. And so on average, um, so children are born with it, obviously, and on average, they, they die before the age of two. So it's really important for us to get a treatment for this. And so I'm essentially making small molecules that um, kind of act like band-aids for, for proteins or enzymes and, and help them refold. It's all... Um, I'm actually not that familiar with the protein stuff. I'm not. I'm not a protein scientist, so I was really thrown in the deep end with this one. But um, it's really cool. Oh, awesome, and um, and I guess you've seen. I mean, for listeners out there, um, Lucy has also just been nominated to be, hopefully, 
a three minute thesis finalist um, for Asia Pacific. So obviously the passion is coming through when you when you talk about it. Because what you said really, really early on, which rings in my mind, is being able to communicate what you're doing in science, because science is such a crazy complex world because that's the world we live in. But for people to actually understand it and re relate to it, you've got to be able to talk about it. And has that been something that, that you've actively tried to to think about as you're doing your, your, your research or is it something that's just natural for you? Yeah, well, I think I would have never considered myself a public speaker at school, really. Um, and then I kind of got to uni and there were just kind of so many talks that were just boring or, you know, you'd hear a talk and you'd be like, this is really cool science. This is a really cool topic, but you are just not communicating that to me. And I, it's always such a missed opportunity, I think. Um, and I, I, I have very specific memories of um, Professor Lyle Hanton um, at Otago, and he would just run around um, the St. David's Lecture Theatre, pointing his laser pointer at the screen, and he'd be like, this stuff is so cool, and it, it just makes you so passionate, you know, you're so much more interested in the topic, you absorb so much more, and so I always tried to kind of carry that through my tutoring, um, through any teaching that I did and in any talks that I did, I was like, this is going to be easy to understand at the very least. And at, most importantly, it's going to be bloody interesting. Like that's always kind of my my key wants from my talks. It's it's always been really important to me, yeah. And that's really, I mean, you know, um, as you know, I do public speaking every single day. And um, I always have to remember that every group I speak to has never heard this information before. I might have said it a million times, and I like how you say you've got to keep it engaging and you've got to keep it fun. Um, because the stuff we talk about sometimes is quite dry and boring to some people who are just like, what am I doing here? And But they actually need to be there. Yeah. And if it's dry and boring, they're like, oh, I'm just going to tune out. So um, it's awesome that you that you, that you see that as, as a need, as a, not as a need, but actually as something that should just be a natural thing for a science communicator. Yeah. I think that um, I think science is sort of um, lacking interest in communication sometimes, and I, I love that we're seeing this emergence of science communication. And you know, there's the science communication degree at Otago now, and they just have so much fun doing what they do. And I, I think that it's um, it's such an important skill. And kind of thinking about what you do in terms of your public speaking, I I remember you coming to my school, and you were just like. Otago, 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 and you made us feel really passionate about it. And I think you, you know, like you kind of talk about how it's your job to get people passionate, and and you really do. You, I, I, I remember it so vividly. Oh wow, that's that's very 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 kind of you. Um, yeah, it's it comes back to a learned experience. You know, when I was at school and when I was when I had all these talks as so when I was a lecturer, my when I was at the university in South Africa, the one lecture that stood out for me was when we came to class. So in South Africa it was very very different. In South Africa you had to go to class. You had they had roll they had roll call. So oh, sure. uh, wow. they, had, they had roll call. So I went to a class. It was a little paper. I remember this very blatantly. And so in South Africa they would have Dallas chips, and with the Dallas chip you have to scan in, and everybody's got to scan in. And if you miss three classes, so it goes into this is really crazy. This is I always think about university in New Zealand like we're way way far behind. At that time in South Africa when I went to university, everything was on 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 a database so you scan in and you can jump onto your your vision type thingy and it'll tell you you've missed a class not missed a class oh, you missed wow. the class it tells you straight away that you can't get the class so anyway this lecturer comes in and he was the head of the, the department and like similar to lyle he didn't start talking about his his program he just did this amazing thing which i i stole from him where he made us create a thunderstorm in the lecture theater and that has always stood out for me as a wow he just engaged with us straight away and um and that was where I was like, wow, if I'm going to talk to people, I've got to be able to engage them straight away. And then I remember going to my computer science class and um, the roll call there was very different. What they would do is they would take your, your ID photos, they put into a database, then just a random, and they pick five people. And they go random, random, random. Okay, cool. This is a class today. Okay, cool. Take. And if, every time you're in class, they take away the picture from, from the, the database because you've been to class. But if Lucy and Pradesh haven't come to class, then the next day they multiply Lucy and Pradesh's pictures times five. So the, the chances of you getting caught become five times higher. Yeah, and if sure. you don't go the next day, they multiply by 10. So I was like, wow, this is such a great way to engage people to come to class. It's just fun, right? It's just fun. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, it's, it's really, it's like goes back to those lectures that you remember, those teachers that you remember, and how do you, how do you want to pass that message? And 
So Lucy, what about what about your other passions? So we obviously science is a passion, communication is a passion, but what else? This is just one part of your life here. And what else are you are you a champion for? Or you you find yourself that this is really important for you in your in your world? I think uh, I I think I really um want to champion in my career and in like in my life just you know social equity and yeah. you know getting people into like specifically university spaces, right? Um you know, kind of like I said before, being the the youngest in an immigrant family um, from a family with not very much money, university never seemed like an option for me. And so actually being able to get there was facilitated by people like you, do you know what I mean? People like you that went, you can do this. And I really want to make sure that kind of in my career, I get to kind of champion people in whatever space they want to be in, whether they um, want to you know go to university or whether they want to do trades or something you know like I I always want to kind of make people know that they can they can be in those spaces and I think science as well right science is so dominated by men and it's so dominated by Pakeha people and so kind of what like I want to see more people that look like me in science spaces I want to see more women I want to see more people of color specifically in chemistry right I don't I, I can't really comment on the the demographics of of other sciences but um yeah. i know that chemistry has like kind of the the biggest spaces in chemistry are all um older older pakeha men and so i really i really care about making sure that our our space is more diverse um and yeah th that's incredibly important to me and another thing that i i really want is just to to make sure that it's that, that it's easy as possible like i think so often you know university and education is just so difficult and so <clears throat> kind of figuring out ways to to make that easier for people um yeah i was i was lucky enough to get um one of the i think it's the priscilla sandys winch scholarship in taranaki which was the only reason i could go to university and so you know like i look at all of these things like all of these really helpful people that facilitated getting me into this space and all of these awesome scholarships that were set up by awesome people and I just, I want to kind of be there in some way. I, I don't really know what that looks like yet, but um, I, 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 it kind of comes back to this again. Like I want to give back to the system that gave me so much. And it's, it's really, it's really quite profound. I mean, that you've mentioned that. I think there's two things we're gonna, we will touch on there. The social inequality that happens in, I guess, just generally, you know, um, first in family or low socioeconomic, you have barriers galore, you know, like I said, there's two things, those, those two are intertwined, you know, um, first of all, you've got to battle the the cultural construct in certain families and cultures that actually going to university is a reality. Sometimes it's not. Or, or gender classification, you're a young female, you can't go to university. That's the first barrier. The next barrier is the cost. You know, going to university is, has got a cost attached to it. And unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know, a lot of the media hype is, hey, why would you spend all this money to go to university? And, you know, it's to fight those stereotypes that actually university is not just about a career, but if you think about yourself, if you hadn't taken that jump, you wouldn't be where you are today. You didn't say, I want to go to university to become a PhD researcher. You went to university to go, hey, this is, I'm going to see what happens. And um, initially, and it'll change. But it's, it's those social barriers are really, really quite hard. And, and people like you um, need a voice to be able to speak about that. And unfortunately, I don't know how that happens. I mean, I, would, I would have some pretty cool ideas. Um, but again, I work in the constraints of of my job description, which makes things pretty hard. Yeah. Um, but again, the, the other thing that you mentioned, which I think is very important for us to realize in New Zealand, is we have we have a social support structure that is pretty amazing. You know, the PSW Trust, who are an amazing, amazing group of people that um, you know, um, they give so much money and they they help young people, especially those in financial hardship or life hardship, to give that first stepping stone to go into the next stage. But also we have, you know, um, I have a personal battle with this here. I think we're very lucky that we have, you know, study link, which oh, for some people sure. is, they think it's a negative <clears throat> thing, but I think it's a fantastic opportunity investment. Um, and I'm guessing they helped, that helped you as well to get through your program. Yeah, absolutely. Like, um, because um, both my parents, they, they don't work, um, they're retired. So I was entitled to full study link and, you know, I, I, there's just no way I would have gotten through university without without that system. And it is a pain to fill out those papers every year, but it's it's really worth it. <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's it's investment, right? I see it's investment, and you know, um, especially for for families who can't afford it, 
you know this is a a, a lifeline to go actually you can you can do it so um I, I love i love i love those passions of yours because those passions i mean i always um this is going to sound crazy but um irrespective of people's political opinions i heard a talk by john key once when he came to the university of otago to do a thing and oh whatever he said but the one thing he did say i remember he said when he was growing up his his mom said to him you need to you need to have education education is important and he was like why do you have to do that then he said because they can take People can come and take anything with me in your life. They can come in, they can take away your your phone, your your house, your roof, but they'll never be able to take away take away education. And to me, that's just stuck as a yeah, you know, education empowers and allows you to do so many different things. And whatever it is, it could be a trade. It could be education yeah. is is all encompassing. It's not just going to university. Um, yeah. So that's I'm really, that's pretty awesome that you want to. If you are not, if you want, you are already in that space there, which is pretty cool. Yeah, I think. I, I recently had a, a really, um, well, so we have, a, like, at, we're at uni, uh, occasionally I'll just randomly realise that I'm one of the, the only female in the room, and I go, oh, that's just not okay, like, I, I, I understand that that's not um, anyone's fault, that's, yeah. that's present, right, but it's, and, and also, you know, I'm the only queer person in the room, I'm the only person of, um, like, BIPOC person in the room, and it's, it, it's just strange I think it, it, it just doesn't reflect society either and yeah. so I think I want my spaces to better reflect society I, I think and um I'll I'm, I'm excited to see how I champion that in my lifetime you, do you know what I mean like I'm I I'm really excited to see how how I'm going to have an effect there and that's, uh, yeah I'm, I'm excited as well I'm, I'm pretty excited I'm pretty sure there will be a profound effect coming through so that's really really cool Listen, we've been talking for almost an hour now, um, which is pretty crazy. Um, we can keep talking on and on and on because I think you're a very interesting person and have some amazing stories to share. But we're going to wrap up our podcast now. And um, we like to wrap up about our podcast with a question we ask our guests. Our podcast is called Bosses of Knowledge. And we'd love you to share some piece of knowledge that you'd like our listeners to put into their basket of knowledge through your experiences or through something that you go, hey, this, is, this would be useful no matter where you are in life I guess mm. it's a big question isn't it yeah it is a really big question I think yeah it, it's a really big question I think kind of you know we, we've already touched on it um is is just keep doing what you love um just keep doing what you love and you know everything will fall into place um and at any point you can quit you know I think that that's another really important thing too um and yeah 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 and, and I guess if if we make that into a positive statement, you can you can change at any point. You can change. So if exactly, it, if, if, it's if, probably if, a better way of wording it. <laughs> no, but I, but I know exactly what I mean. You know, so you can you can say I'm quitting, but quitting is just change. I'm just changing my plan. I've been going in a different way, um, yeah. which is a cool thing. You know, do what you love, and it's okay to change your mind. One hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Just and I'm just going to add to one more thing. I always think that people think there's a good or a bad decision. I just think there's a decision. Yes. Whatever. Yes, this is absolutely. I think there's, there's been so many times in my life that I've been making a decision and I'm like, what's the outcome going to be? And it's like, we're just not going to know. And, you know, we're just going to have to make this decision. And that's the decision made. Yeah. And then you just roll with it and you can change. You can change. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Lucy, thank you so much for um, for this time today. Um, I've really enjoyed speaking to you. And I, I mean, I always enjoy interacting with you whenever I see you in person. So I'm looking forward to that in the in the new year um but thank you so much for your time and i'm sure listeners would have picked up and learned a lot through your experiences today and look forward to seeing what you do over the next few years look up world here comes lucy <laughs> thank you <laughs> thank very you much. So much for having me yeah thanks uh, for having me i've really enjoyed chatting oh uh, well, thank you everybody and for our listeners out there thank you for listening as always um uh, feel free to like comment and share this podcast with anyone that you're out there and always we love comments and feedback thank you everybody till next time like you said Thank you for listening to Baskets of Knowledge. Yeah, we hope that you found something useful to put into your baskets of knowledge. And as we said before, remember to put something little into your baskets of knowledge every week. And as always, feel free to like, comment, and share this podcast. Thanks, everybody. Bye.